Greetings, fellow travelers, and welcome back to beautiful San Diego. Today, we will pick up where we left off last time and trek through the outdoor portion of the Discovery Outpost. On exiting the Reptile House, we come across two yards. On the right, we find a habitat housed in European pond turtles, marginated tortoises, Skeltu pusix, and the jeweled Lacerta. Both male and female marginated tortoises have rear scoots that spread out like a fan to form a skirt, and these tortoises can be seen decorating fountains and frescoes of ancient Greek sculptures and paintings. The yard to the left of exiting the reptile house is home to both western great and yellow-throated plated lizards, as well as the radiated tortoise. Found in the dry thorn forest of southern Madagascar, radiated tortoises may become extinct in the wild within the next 45 years. Locals hunt these tortoises for food and collectors take them for the global pet trade. Protection laws in these parts are difficult to enforce. A favorite food in the wild is the Unpuntia cactus and they are known to graze regularly in the same area, keeping the vegetation in those areas closely trimmed. Signing down this walkway talks about seasonal wetlands or life in a temporary pool, as well as describes some of the native plants in California, like the Baja Fairy Duster and the Basket Rush. This exhibit hall is broken up into two sections. The left side, which we are going down now, houses 10 terrariums with 14 species of amphibians. And here we will learn that amphibians live in moist places or near water to keep from drying out. Young amphibians breathe through external gills. When they become adults, most develop lungs, and most can breathe through their skin as well. There are more than 6,000 species of amphibians, and one-third are threatened. First up, we can find the green and black poison frog, sharing a habitat with the splashback. Poison frogs are brightly colored as a warning. Don't eat me or you'll be sorry. The splendid tree frog's large toe pads help them climb trees and stick to slick surfaces. The Asian giant toad feeds at night along the rocky rivers and streams of mainland Southeast Asia. They swallow whatever live prey they can fit in their mouth. Females of this species will construct a foam nest and attach it to the plants above the water. When the tadpoles hatch, they fall right into the water. The fire salamander's name comes from the fact that people once believed it was born in fire. If the color doesn't warn off predators, the tomato frog inflates its body with air to look large and imposing. It can secrete a toxin from skin glands that repel most predators. Here we have a shared habitat for dying poison frogs, milky tree frogs, and a black-legged poison frog. Pet traders carelessly overcollected this newt. More than 80% of the population was taken in just 10 years. Coming down the right side of this exhibit hall, we will find species native to California, seven terrariums featuring toads, lizards, and snakes. Here we are reminded that snakes are a sign of a healthy ecosystem and that people benefit from snakes as many of these predators eat pest insects, mice, and rats. Classified as a species of special concern in California, these toads are nearly extinct in this state. This is one of only two species of boas native to the United States. Non-venomous and harmless to people, this snake mimics a rattlesnake when threatened, hissing loudly while shaking its tail back and forth, and is one of the most commonly seen local snakes. Though they eat a wide variety of insects, a third of this lizard's diet consists of ants. Rat snakes are named for their diet. Besides rodents, they also eat bats and lizards, and they often make its home among Baja's native plants, including fan palms and date palms. Here we get our overhead look and first view of the Chinese alligator. A few small populations survive in agricultural wetlands, but most Chinese alligators now live only in breeding centers. Survival outside of managed care can happen only if wetlands can be restored. The Chinese alligator is one of only two alligator species in the world. It travels the swamps, ponds, and slow-moving streams along the Yangtze River, feeding mostly on snails and mussels by crushing them with its short, blunt teeth. 
Next up is six habitats, home to nine species of turtles. Here we learn that half the world's 300 species of turtles and tortoises are in danger of extinction. Some due to what's called commercially extinct, meaning so many have been taken for the pet trade that they may very soon be extinct in the wild. This species, instead of retracting its head, wraps its long neck sideways and tucks its head close. This turtle was hatched at the zoo. This is part of the zoo's endangered species breeding program. All 13 species of turtles in this genus are at risk of extinction. The Parker's snake neck turtles hatched at the zoo in 2017 and shares its habitat with the Fly River turtle. The last habitat in this hall houses South American snake neck turtles red-headed river turtles, as well as the Mata Mata. Past the turtle hall, we come to multiple viewing areas of gharials and several species of turtles. Gharials are related to alligators and crocodiles. The skeleton we saw a moment ago shows the unique body armor for those reptiles. All crocodilians share certain features. They have a heavy skull, rows of bony plates embedded in the skin of the back, and a sheet of bone that separates the mouth from the nasal passages. We also passed a fossil replica of an ancient crocodilian that had lived in the early Jurassic period, showing that the body structure has not changed much in the past 190 million years. Sharing this habitat are Hamilton's pond turtles, red-bellied short-neck turtles, broad-shelled snake-neck turtles, Asian leaf turtles, river terrapins, painted terrapins, narrow-headed soft-shell turtles, Malaysian giant turtles, yellow pond turtles, Parker's snake-neck turtles, and the Indo-Gangetic flap-shell turtle. Unlike most crocodilians, female gharials are unable to assist their hatchlings to water due to their unique jaw structure. However, they do protect their young around the nesting area for several weeks after hatching. They also have the largest eggs of all the crocodilian species, weighing in around 6.4 ounces each. When a male gharial reaches about 10 years of age, a bump of cartilage starts to grow at the tip of the snout. An adult male can make a buzzing noise to this knob, and these are the only crocodilians that grow these knobs. Past this, we come by the habitats of the brown tortoise and the African spurred tortoise. Whereas most tortoises dig their nest in soil, the brown tortoise builds a mound of leaves and debris. And in spite of its endangered status and reduced habitat, this large tortoise is still hunted for food and collected for the pet trade. As we start making our way around the last leg of our loop, on our left-hand side, we will come across two yards of house ground caiman iguanas, where we find out that dogs, cats, and rats, which are non-native predators, are posing a major threat to this species. Experts are breeding and head-starting these critical endangered iguanas. The goal of this project is to repopulate a protected area on Grand Cayman. And here's our first glimpse of the stars of this show, the Galapagos tortoise. San Diego Zoo has one of the largest groups of Galapagos tortoises and is working diligently to help the species. Signs indicate that as of 2018, they had 94 hatchlings and have sent tortoises to other zoos for breeding. During this time, they have also returned one tortoise named Diego back to the Galapagos Islands, where he has helped the subspecies by having many offspring. Each subspecies has a different shell shape, depending on the island and habitat it's from. Those that dwell in lush meadows have a dome shell, keeping them low to the ground, where it's easier to eat grass, while those in areas that is hard to reach food have a shell curved in front so they can stretch their neck up to eat leaves. The shells on the Galapagos turtles can measure six feet long and four foot wide, and males can weigh up to 600 pounds. These are the top herbivores on the volcanic islands in which they live, and they have little to no competition for food. Some have been reported to live more than 150 years. Many of the zoo's tortoises have been here since 1928. 
making them well over 100 years old. They can be identified by the numbers painted on their shell. Males have white numbers and females have red. The original tortoises are white, 6, 7, 23, and 25, and red, 4, 5, 7, 8, and 9. Giant tortoises reach maturity at around 20 to 25 years old. After breeding, females journey several miles to reach nesting areas, laying large, hard-shelled eggs in holes about 12 inches deep and covering them with sand. If the nest temperature is low, more males will hatch. If it is high, more females will hatch. Hatchlings weigh just a few ounces at birth. And now we make our way to the last habitat in the Discovery Outpost, the home of southern leopard tortoises. Predators of this species include lions, bats, monitor lizards, snakes, and people. And another fun fact that these slow moving land dwellers are actually quite good swimmers. And this will conclude our trek through the Discovery Outpost at the San Diego Zoo. Thank you for joining me. This is Brad, and I will see you where our adventures take us next. Until next time, safe travels, everyone.